Welcome to Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn. And I'm Chris Noble. And we're on a journey to explore the brightest and most innovative minds and initiatives in social purpose. Today, companies and brands must stand for something meaningful. They have to have a social purpose and bring that purpose forward to their employees, their customers, and their community. Each episode, we're talking to leaders at Fortune 100 companies, global brands, social enterprise startups, NGOs, and everything in between. We'll be taking a deep dive to learn how they are integrating purpose into their organizations. To benefit both business and society for enduring impact. Join us. Welcome to Purpose 360. Today we have one of my favorite people in sustainability joining us, Bob Langer. And he's actually one of my heroes. I remember, oh, a number of years ago that we shared a panel at Sustainable Brands. And I looked across the table in awe because here's someone who has made such an impact through his over 25 years at McDonald's. He retired in 2015 as vice president of CSR and sustainability, but he is still fighting the great fight. He's got a new book that just came out. We're going to talk a little bit about that, the battle to do good inside McDonald's sustainability journey. But Bob talks about stand tall for what you stand for. And so we're going to really hear great insights from him today. So let's get started. Welcome to our show. Well, thanks for those remarks. Glad to be with you. <laughs> they're, they're very well deserved. I'm hoping someday, Bob, I'll be one of her heroes too. <laughs> well, we're working on it. So, Bob, let's start out with what is your personal purpose? Well, simply put, you know, I, I've always thought I want to make a difference in the world. Started out as a kid in the 60s. I still think I'm a product of the, the 60s of trying to part of that social revolution. But uh, at a deeper level, you know, something happened to me in 1990 and you know, where my brother was killed, his wife was killed, their unborn child was killed. And this was... I'm sorry to hear that. I, I only say that because you asked what my purpose is. And what happened at that time mm. through this horrible thing was... Uh, it was right when I was beginning to do all this work for McDonald's. It was right at the very beginning of my career in social responsibility. And I had decided, you know what? Hey, my life could end tomorrow. Uh, I thought I was a little bit too complacent in things I was doing. I had this opportunity that was bubbling up at McDonald's. And I, right then and there, I said, you know what? I'm going to do as much good as I can and do as much to combat evil as I can. You talked about social responsibility and also the term sustainability. And there's a lot of terms. I mean, when I started doing the work in the early 80s, it was cause marketing, then cause branding, shared value. So what's your definition of sustainability today? Well, today in the corporate setting, you know, first of all, I would start out as very holistic. You know, a lot of people look at sustainability through a very narrow vision. So it's very holistic, you know, meaning for a company like McDonald's, it's it's all your societal impacts. It's it's your people, it's your food, it's your nutrition, it's the, it's the health, it's the environment, it's the treatment of animals, it's the economy, uh, it's every touch point for society. So that's where it starts for a definition. But I think for it to truly be, uh, I'd also like to define it as a mindset. You know, it's not an endpoint. So to me, uh, when an organization like McDonald's or anybody says that we're going to be on this journey, it, it would mean that it would be defined by the top management saying it's part of the business. You would have people in charge of this. You would have goals and metrics and accountability and transparency as you would with other aspects of your business. So that's where the proof points would be that you're taking the idea of sustainability and actually making it tangible in your company. Bob, you were, you were at McDonald's from uh, 1983 to 2015. Is, is that right? Yeah, sounds like a long time. <laughs> it sounds like about 200 billion burgers. <laughs> yeah, big company, big brand. And, and by the way, I loved almost every minute of it. It just was so, to, to be given the responsibility of doing good things for the company through such a big brand. I mean, how many people get to do that for a living? I got paid to do this. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty remarkable. Well, so so that's, the, that's the real question though, right? So uh, how many people get to do that? How many brands get to engage in in those kinds of issues? Can you talk a little bit about how how it started, how CSR sustainability issues came to life 
at McDonald's? Well, you know, certainly they, they started uh, from a uh, defensive viewpoint. They started from being totally unaware uh, back in the late 80s. All of a sudden, McDonald's is getting attacked for having CFCs in the packaging, affecting uh, the, the ozone hole, having CFCs in the packaging, the polystyrene clamshell, being a whole symbol of waste in a disposable society. We thought we were running out of landfill space, and McDonald's was a symbol of everything bad on waste. And uh, McDonald's looked at this like, hey, we're, we're not that way. We're a wonderful company. We've been around. We love people in the neighborhood. Our franchisees are part of the community. We're the good guys. And we thought these attacks on the company were uh, like, why are they picking on us? So it started from from that posture, and it started to be reactive. You know, so, okay, fine. We're getting attacked. We were really scrambling. I mean, the reason I got my career was nobody was working at this in McDonald's. It wasn't part of it. We talked about the whole evolution of sustainability. Well, there, when I came out of college, there's no jobs like this. <laughs> right. So right. at this point in time, there's no jobs like this in McDonald's. And somebody above me said, hey, Langer, you're going to be the one to work on this environmental stuff. Help save the polystyrene clamshell. Let's try to recycle it. And uh, we turned something fairly bad into something really good. That's how I cut my teeth. That's how I began. That's how McDonald's began. And it began sort of in a good way because it was a lesson learned that was my pathway for the whole future is that these types of partnerships that you can take something from society that initially looks like it's something, oh my goodness, let's hold our breath. How do we stay out of trouble? Uh, and, And really look at it as an opportunity. So, you know, we ended up engaging with the Environmental Defense Fund, studying how we would reduce waste for six months. These people were not our enemies. I, my best friends now are with the Environmental Defense Fund. We bonded together. We found a lot in common. We made 42 changes to reduce, reuse, recycle. We reduced 300 million pounds during the uh, 1990s in our restaurants. And we didn't spend a penny more. Our reputation increased. We went from the doghouse to the White House. What a story, right? Huh. I mean, so once you begin that way, you see you know, this is what I try to do for my whole career, kind of get these win-win-win situations, which is not always that easy to do. But that's that's how we began. And I would say at least the first 10, 15 years of working on all these things. Unfortunately, I mean, I wish I could recast history and I wish it wasn't such a, a reactive environment. But the, the reality is me, McDonald's, we, we were thrust with issues coming at us from every which way. We didn't know how to deal with them. And we scrambled, but I think we did a pretty good job of scrambling and, you know, formed formed some really good partnerships and made some meaningful changes. So that's actually, that's the moment I want to uh, dial in on a little bit because I want to talk about the partnerships, but I also want to talk about kind of that, that senior level buy-in and, and you say, and I think you're right, a little bit of that is reacting to the times and just understanding how the company has to grow and, and change. But, but what's that moment? Like, where does senior management get bought off on doing these kinds of programs and engaging these kinds of partners? Is it one success builds to many? Or is there some other factor that you, you have to work in order to make it live inside the brand? And, and let me build on that, because I know that um, with Walmart, you know, they were in the you know early aughts, the most hated company. And then when Katrina hit, and they had all of their trucks, because they're perfect at logistics, waiting to go back into New Orleans. And the picture ran in the New York Times. And that's when their CEO said, we want to be like that every day. So was there that seminal moment? I, the way I would describe it is it's more of a uh, evolution that reaches a tipping point. Let me describe that for a minute. You know, we couldn't have done the work that I helped lead for a couple of decades going into, let's say, 2010 without the company wanting to do good things. You know, we really had a good internal uh, ethic, really good people. Every time I was in top management meetings, they would always ask me, you know, what's the right thing to do? Those would always be the first set of questions. And then down the line, they talk about the practical cost implications. So I always felt like work with a good company that wanted to do the right thing, but it wasn't strategic. You know, it wasn't really proactive. Uh, I think eventually, you know, all these things coming at us, it, sometimes I've wondered why, how, we, how we let other people define our purpose and define who we are. And uh, our CEO back, back in about 2010, 2011, it finally reached a tipping point where all these attacks on us, our brand suffered. So if I had to say what was a seminal moment, it's when we looked at our 
our brand health is what we called it. And there's a lot of indicators for our brand health, but about half of them, there's about 42 for McDonald's, by the way, about, about 21 of them are long-term and almost all of these 21 long-term brand health attributes are related to CSR. How do you treat the people? Are you ethical? What's your supply chain like? Are you good for the environment? Issues like that. And uh, our scores were very bad. And uh, it was really a call to action for McDonald's to say, hey, our, our business is growing. In fact, today, McDonald's serves 70 million people a day. It's, it's monolithic. I mean, it's just huge. But yet, uh, we have people that aren't really feeling that good about coming to McDonald's uh, from a brand perspective. And the, this, the big driver for McDonald's to get away from being reactionary to being strategic was related to brand health. I mean, that's the tipping point for us. In some of your notes, you said that 1% brand health improvement equals 2% increase in sales in approximately two, three to five years. Now, that's a significant growth in 70 million um, individuals served daily. Well, I knew you would pick that up, Carol. So, uh, and, and by the way, that's how we looked at it. And that was probably the money slide for our board of directors and our top management team. That's what our, that's what our researchers said. I mean, now, why didn't we work on it maybe earlier? Because, you know, our brand was uh, having all these issues for many years. It's not easy. I see other companies going through the same struggle. It takes three to five years for this to pay off. And that's why a lot of companies don't do it. They don't have the patience. Because, you know, so much of, uh, you know, Mark McDonald's certainly doesn't lack the money. I mean, it spends over $2 billion on marketing every year. So we have the money. But prior to this time that we're talking about, almost all that money was, was allocated for short-term sales and success, not for long-term brand. And, and so that, that changed. Yeah, was there a tipping point with your franchisees? Because, you know, their day-to-day, -day, it's it's their income and revenue, where they felt that, you know, they, they love the Ronald House, and I helped build two Ronald Houses in the 80s. But the longer-term issues of, you know, what's in the food, animal welfare, et cetera, when did franchisees have a tipping point? I think we start to feel that around 2010, it's just like the last couple decades before that, hey, fast food nation, the dark side of the fast food business with McDonald's all over the place, super size me movie, campaigns against us, you know, people perceiving uh, our food as junk food, not real food. When we finally came up with the proactive strategies, the franchisees said, well, hey, it's about time. You know, that's what we pay you. You know, that's what we pay you as a company to defend our brand and let's Stand. Let's take a stand versus being defensive and being reactive. To everybody else defining who we are. So yes, a lot of a lot of support from the franchisees because they're on the front lines and they hear these types of complaints from their customers. We always get to talk to somebody who ha ha was around when traditional PR and CSR were trying to work together to to create that kind of that brand halo, that brand effect, right? A along with doing the actual good work, and then all of a sudden social media hits or the internet and, and tons of review sites hits. So how do you, how do you manage through that change? Uh, we've got a lot of brands that listen that are, are still trying to deal with the change from traditional PR into, into our current world. Well, my critique in today's world that uh, I, I feel that this is one of the, one of the companies, companies in general are very poor at understanding how to market and communicate on sustainability. You just don't get it. They're still, they're still mostly afraid of it. Carol, I know you live and breathe in a space. I'm not sure if you agree or disagree, but, you know, when you get out there and you stick your neck out, you're not a perfect company. And usually what happens is you're going to get taxed somewhere else and the lawyers get involved. The, they like to play it safe. The communicators, believe it or not, like to play it safe. I still am astounded by all these problems that occur in companies and the CEOs make statements and they sound like they're inhuman people saying things that our corporate speak, like they don't come from human beings. So uh, I think it's a big problem. And uh, certainly at McDonald's, we struggled that, with that over the years. I, I tell in the book about how uh, I know when the birth of the internet came about because it was 1995. <laughs> and right. and uh, I tell a story where this McSpotlight, you know, I don't want your listeners maybe to Google McSpotlight, but if you do, I mean, it, <laughs> it was an ugly campaign, but it was the first, I think it was the very first global internet campaign against mcdonald's and it all started with these two people from the united kingdom you know passing out literature that the 
defamed McDonald's. We did a three-year lawsuit. So I tell the story in there, and uh, we didn't know how to deal with this thing. And I think companies today are still struggling because the issue is, how do you be open and transparent in this open and transparent world? And most companies still haven't taken that big step. And in order for people to believe you, in order to be sustainable, you have to be in a space of being open. That means you tell what's good and you tell what's not working. Yeah, I think that's a really good lesson for the for our crowd is just that sustainability and authenticity go hand in hand, right? You can't really have one unless you're exhibiting the other. Let's now turn to partnerships because so much of your work over the years have been creating them, nurturing them. Um, love to hear about us one or two stories. I love the Temple Grandin story, so perhaps you'd share that. And then insights to really making partnerships work. You can't be sustainable in, in most cases unless you part. So you just have to partner because you have to go somewhere else for expertise. You have to go somewhere else for credibility, collaboration. You know, I was given the task, you talk about Temple Grandin. We identified her as the person that could help us be implement an animal welfare program with our suppliers. So my boss told me, Shelby said, hey, Bob, go figure out how to do an animal welfare program and please connect up with Shelby and figure things out. Well, this temple, I mean, she's autistic. You have to understand that. She's uh, brilliant and she's very charismatic. And uh, within the meat industry, she's considered to be uh, like a rock and roll star. When she, so when I went into our first meeting at Los Pez Foods in Oklahoma City, there was like hundreds of people in the hallways, you know, from the rafters, kind of trying to see her. And then she gave a talk and uh, she was very inspirational for our meat suppliers. It didn't take too much work to get them on board to say, hey, we're going to integrate animal welfare, do everything that Temple's asking you to do. And uh, she did her thing. And uh, she was just smart. I mean, we'd go to these slaughterhouses. She'd be on her hands and knees and trying to you know, figure out how the animal thinks and acts. And I'm like, holy moly. And uh, you know, here I am in charge of animal welfare. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I, that's why you need partnerships. Nobody at McDonald's knows how to implement an animal welfare program. We implemented all this work in the late 90s, early 2000s, such that now if you were to go to a slaughterhouse, rather than like today, you would go, it's like going to a library. The animals kind of naturally flow through, et cetera. Everybody's at peace. When I went to my first slaughterhouse in 1998 with Temple, the, all the animals were getting zapped with an electronic zapper. That's how they moved animals. Zap them, zap them, zap them. Again, I'm not a scientist, but I think something's wrong here. And Temple said that, yeah, we don't need to be zapping. We need to create flags and design to have the, the animals move naturally. So Temple was my absolute favorite person to work for. I came up with these, uh, these three Ps that I learned from her. She had passion, she had persistence, and she had patience. If you think about that for a few seconds, she did all those things at the same time, which is sort of schizophrenic. But I always view that, that that's how I would be. She never gave up. She would be insulted. She would be uh, have defeat. And the next day, she's up doing it again, trying to move things forward. And she had such passion for the animals. She didn't uh, have a political bone in her body. She couldn't filter things. So I always thought, hey, I'm apolitical. I mean, I always, my mission at McDonald's was, I don't take sides. It's not about personality. I'm going to be a, a champion for what is right. I'm going to be apolitical. That's, that was my mission. And, uh, but then I realized I'm not like Temple. I mean, she just has no filter at all. It just comes out. So everything she does, you know, is true blue. And then, by the way, this work was not only for McDonald's. It's for the entire meat industry. It all transformed that all meat suppliers do it around the globe. So when you realize that you are part of something, that changes something across the whole sector, across the globe. And you couldn't have done it without a Temple Grandin. Uh, one person can make a difference. And I think I've read in some of your interviews that you've stated that nothing is more rewarding than working on transformative change. So that's a, a tremendous um, insight, and it, it seems like it's part of your soul. Oh, yeah. You shouldn't, uh, like in today's world, I mean, Every day I went into work, I usually thought of just one or two things. I'm going to, 
sustainable beaks became a big thing. And so we wanted to, so I would come into work every day thinking, okay, I'm going to work on these 10 things related to sustainable beef to move the needle. I'm not going to do anything else until I've, I've exhausted everything to move because that's the big thing we can do. I mean, on your list of things to do, I think social media, all the emails that people get, et cetera, et cetera, these are so destructive to uh, leaders that want to be effective because they clutter everything up. So you really have to sort of like be, be like Temple. You have to be almost like single-minded because you only have so much time to be a leader and you should make transformative change and transformative change takes a lot of effort. So uh, get rid of the riffraff in, in your day and go after the big ones. It's it's not just those three Ps. It's also focus. And and the real question for me is how do you not maintain that focus for yourself? It, it's definitely harder these days with constant notification and bombardment but organizationally how do you maintain that focus how do you like what proof points do you have to keep bringing back what metrics do you need to be using so that you can lead and guide the whole organization forward well it, it goes back to having a strategy and a framework and uh, it was interesting when we finally got to do this you know mcdonald's we first we released our first framework with goals and metrics and accountability in 2014. So imagine this journey we're talking about. It took a long time, 24, 25 years to go from reactive to finally being strategic, getting it embedded. And I've seen what McDonald's has done since. I mean, it's, it's awesome. But that's where you do it, Chris, to answer your question. Because uh, you're not sustainable unless it's run through your management team to say, hey, these are the things that we're truly going to focus on. I remember when we started our framework, we came in, we had five pillars with 28 goals. And uh, I was kicked out of the room. And uh, they, they said, that's just, that is so unreasonable to think that we as a global company are going to focus on 28 things to do. So, you know, that was very humbling and uh, for our team. So, you know, we went back to the drawing board. We eventually had five pillars and nine goals. And by the way, the language that I use, and I still think it's great language for today, and this is a advice that I have for your listeners trying to force change. I just, I really love the shared value language. It was just so good to work within McDonald's to say that, hey, you know, we're only going to work on things that help grow our business and make a, a big impact on society. So let's let's go through what we can do. And we every meeting, it would be, well, hey, that's not going to, you know, that's not going to do any good for our business. I go, okay, fine. I agree with you. Let's put it by the side. Maybe a few years from now, it's good for our business. But you will find things that are good for business and are good for society at the, at the most impactful levels. And those are the things you should choose. The first time ever I was given, uh, I was given uh, Don Thompson, our CEO, said, I want to spend a half day with our, with our top 40 leaders on sustainability. Bob, do whatever you want. You have the whole floor for four hours. And by the way, this is a two-day meeting, so it's a big chunk of time. This is my opportunity. This is my opportunity. This is how am I going to do it? So I learned from Coca-Cola. Hats off to B. Perez. I love you. <laughs> she had invited she had invited me into a meeting at Coke to their top management team with a, a bunch of other leaders that were from companies and NGOs, and I loved it. And we, we were asked all the tough questions. We gave their top leadership a lot of great insight. And so when I came back to McDonald's, I said, you know what? I'm going to do this. So I, I brought in some very top NGO. I, I brought in the head of the World Wildlife Fund. I put, brought in the head of uh, Greenpeace. I brought in the, the head of Unilever and Walmart and so on. And, and by the way, when they were asked at this first look, it was called first look meeting, when they were asked by an independent moderator, because we wanted to be very independent and provocative. You know, this was not corporate friendly. This was like, let's really get into it. The independent moderator asked the all eight of the leaders in two different sessions, if you were CEO for a day, what one thing would you do? Seven of the eight said, hey, your, your brand is about beef. You should do something to make beef more sustainable. And that was the tipping point for our management team to, to realize that in the hallways afterwards, the, the number two guy in the company, which I, I thought he'd be the last one to embrace this idea, he was pretty sarcastic about the whole idea beforehand he goes to me you know wow this is a sustainable beef thing we should be doing this <laughs> oh, i mean go. i realized how effective that session was and really that was i really felt there's a whole bunch of people working on steam when mcdonald's announced sustainable beef as a goal in 2014 that we're going to start buying it in the future we didn't even have a definition of it we didn't even understand it 
And, and so for a conservative company like McDonald's to, to do that, I go, wow, how far we have come. So, so you're really living the mantra, which is, you know, it doesn't have to be perfection. Just keep it moving along. Well, I, I, I wish there's more. I wish there's more, more of an attitude like that. As a matter of fact, you know, within the sustainability crowd that I travel in, a lot of people view what you just said as incrementalism, and they kind of criticize it. Uh, but I don't know where you get unless you, you know, keep moving forward. Perhaps a little bit at a time. A little bit at a time adds up to a lot of a lot of things over time, and uh, and you're not going to get a lot of companies on board. I mean, let's face it. You know, a lot of the big companies are are embracing this, and that's wonderful. But if you really look at all the companies in the world, down to the mid-sized and small companies, we still have a long way to go, and we can't be making sustainability an intimidating thing. Yeah, that, that's actually exactly where I wanted to go next. When when you talk about because you've talked about you know key partnerships and bringing other companies and other examples together. And, you know, how to, how to use that force of argument, right, to, to move your company. But, but especially big brands, big brands move slow and they're conservative. So if you're going to change the whole industry, how do, how do these companies, how do large companies form key partnerships to actually change industry practices? Large companies have uh, the power to influence and collaborate and pull people together and convene, the convening power. That's what we finally recognized. And uh, we had learned through, you know, what I call the school of hard knocks. You know, each of my chapters ends up with uh, hard knock nuggets. And we had learned the hard way, by the way, early on. You know, we mandated certain changes with our suppliers. And believe me, it wasn't well received. You know, when we mandated that the egg suppliers needed to enlarge the size of their cages back in 2001, they said, heck no, we, who are you to tell us what to do? All 27 suppliers of McDonald's refused to do business, and we had to get new suppliers. Can you imagine that? I mean, we're 2% of the egg market, and they said, no, we don't want to do business with you anymore. So, you know, what we learned is we didn't want to mandate. We wanted to collaborate. So when it came to beef, and that's the, to me, beef is everything that you just asked. We want to change beef and make it more sustainable. When we know that maybe the beef ranchers, they don't want to be messed with. They, they think they're sustainable already, which I respect, by the way. Uh, but, but still, we want to make it part of the whole uh, beef production process, have it be measurable, provable, et cetera. And you can only do that by bringing everybody to the table. So, you know, I was really proud that we actually went to the World Wildlife Fund and asked them. To set up one of their famous, like they have this whole roundtable approach. Their, their their idea is let's bring people in at scale from the whole farm to table process, so that we have all the stakeholders at the table to develop you know standards, guidelines, and metrics. So we actually initiated initiated that process versus somebody coming to us. And then you know we went to Cargill and said, hey, can you join? We went to Walmart, can you join? We went to uh, other companies, JBS, the biggest beef company in the world, asked them to join. They said yes. So before you know it, you know we had mass and scale, and people working together and collaborating. So I think that's the highest level of uh, partnership is getting the whole spectrum from beginning to end at the table to agree. And in some ways, compromise. Carol, you mentioned you mentioned before. I think the enemy of so many people in the sustainability movement is they they they, they want it. They want an end state that's perfect tomorrow. That is so high in the sky. Right. Why not start? The critics of sustainable beef today say, "Well, you're not doing enough on antibiotics, for example." Okay, I agree. Okay, should we stop the process? No, I mean. I think what they're doing on sustainable beef now is probably 70% great. What's wrong with 70%? And then maybe we'll evolve to being 80% two or three years from now. So I, I think uh, these are some of the attributes that are needed in effective partnerships. The NGOs that join this, my hat's off to them. I, I just I love the likes of the World Wildlife Fund, the Environmental, the Environmental Defense Fund. If, if there's a leader... In this world, in this space, it's them. Conservation International. And there's others that I'm not naming. I, I hate to leave them all out. But the NGOs that have all this passion and science and want to make a difference, and they're willing to get in there elbow to el elbow with companies and cattle ranchers and hog ranchers or manufacturers. Uh, and they, they have 
they want to collaborate. They have the patience to not change the world overnight, but change the world over time. Uh, these groups are doing uh, some great good. Ab- absolutely. But before we close, I, I do want uh, you to comment on the Ronald House and Ronald House Children's Charities. In the 80s, uh, that work from McDonald's and their uh, owner operators, because it was so local, uh, was had a profound impact on families, um, certainly on the company's reputation. How has the Ronald House over time with in a you know transparent world and social media, um, how is that st- still an important part of McDonald's a reputation and a love for the brand. People that work for McDonald's like me, you know, we just think Ronald McDonald's charity is, is so wonderful. And uh, I mean, we, this is like almost the ideal charity. That's it's one that hits our brand, hits children, helps children out. And uh, when you're in the company, you realize that you know, we do so much to raise money through our suppliers, our customers, to through, you know, for helping kids. It's just, it it really is a special part of our culture that our whole we call it the three legged stool, where suppliers, owner operators, and company people are really dedicated to something a little bit outside the business. Just to share a little funny story on this, because a lot of the sustainability people, I think, are a little bit cynical uh, about these. Maybe they're philanthropic efforts, right? And uh, when I did my first CSR report in 2002, I had a little chapter about the Ronald McDonald House charity and kind of touting the good things we do, which I think are really, are, they're real. They're good. We help kids out, families. And uh, this person reviewed my chapter and she said, well, you should take out the RMHC. That's not germane to your business. It doesn't really matter. Philanthropy like that is not sustainability. Just stick to other things. And I kept it in. I didn't listen to her. Well, I listened to her, but I put it in. And uh, a year later, she called back and she just apologized. She said, well, I, I really didn't know like how how real Ronald McDonald House charity is because her sister went to a Ronald McDonald House in Minneapolis and uh, was there for several weeks with her kid and had a very meaningful experience. Then she realized this is not like rhetoric. This is a, a real charity doing good work. We always kept a little bit of a firewall with the charity because it's a separate foundation and management team, but the people running it were McDonald's employees. So a little bit interesting how he ran it. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't really part of the mainstream McDonald's because we legally needed to keep it as a separate charity, but probably one of the best charities that you could ever imagine a company being behind. Oh, it's wonderful. And I remember Shamrock Shakes and Cause Marketing and, you know, how many millions of dollars that simple little product raised for um, the Ronald Houses. Um, We're going to unfortunately have to bring this uh, soon to a close, but I would love you to to share, like, why your our listeners should buy your book. I know you interviewed over 51 um, other individuals, but you could have just been all about yourself. Self. Um, so uh, I want you. I want to give you a the best plug <laughs> that you can for your book. Well, yeah, this is not a memoir, so that's you know, hey, the life of Bob Langer is not, not all that interesting. But I, but I, <laughs> but I do think I do think the life of McDonald's, and that's what I wanted to do with the book. I wanted to bring you into this uh, battle to do good, and uh, I wanted the reader to really get into what it's really like. And I hope I achieved it. And I achieved it by saying, hey. I'm going to bring you in when, you know, Greenpeace attacks us for deforesting the Amazon, sends us all these demands that we uh, agree with them uh, to something they want us to do. And then I'm going to take you through how I looked at it. I'm going to take you through how our supply chain leadership looked at it because their voices and their thinking is in this chapter that I write about this incident. Uh, Greenpeace is in the chapter. Uh, how they were, why they did it, why they chose us, how they were thinking about us as they worked with us. And uh, it was meant to be just a, an open and transparent view of dealing with some of the toughest issues of our times within a, a brand. What bigger? I mean, there's some bigger brands out there, but we're one of the biggest. So I think for those that are in the sustainability profession, I really wrote it for you because I feel these stories, the people that are profiled, the, the lessons learned, I felt it took me way too long to be, to be a good leader. If I was a good leader, I hope I was. I tried hard. 
But I know it took me a long time to be effective at it. And I think by reading this book, maybe you can take some shortcuts and learnings that makes it better for you. But I also wrote the book for general, I mean, for, for people in your listening audience that aren't in sustainability, I want you to read the book because I think you'll be fascinated by it. I think you'll learn. I wanted to give it to your friends and colleagues because not enough people knows what goes behind the closed doors and companies. And that's what I was trying. That's what I was trying to achieve. That's super. That's super. That that's so so great. We'd love to hear uh, you know where we can find you online, where we can find links to the book. I assume I, you're you're on Amazon, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm I'm very I'm very engaged. Uh, and by the way, any any way I can help younger people, you know, I'm very much into net impact. I just came back from a net impact uh, talk. I, I love. If I had a purpose in my life now, I'd like to help younger leaders make a difference. So that's a little pitch out there. But, hey, you can reach me on LinkedIn, Bob Langert, at Bob Langert. That's the same at Twitter. I'm pretty engaged there. I'm at BobLangert.com. My book is widely available online, including at Amazon.com. And uh, for people that read it uh, and like it, you know, please pass it on and give me a review. <laughs> In closing, we love to ask you, what are your top three insights for sustainability professionals um, on their journey to activate and have an impact with their work? First of all, I was for those that are at the beginning of their journey, and I think it's a continuum, but if you're at the beginning, you know, my advice would be to uh, raise your hand, volunteer, get involved in the organization you're involved with, with the sustainability stuff. Uh, learn, listen, admire the leaders that you see, learn about the business, and probably most importantly, develop relationships. We haven't talked about this, so I really want to say that I think one of the key attributes of a great leader is one that has really genuine relationships before they're needed. <laughs> and you start that you start that young in your career. <laughs> I think, secondly, it surprises me how important the art of being an influencer is in the sustainability field. So if, if I were you out there, I would look at every way I can to figure out how I can be influential. And by the way, communication and how to be persuasive is a very big part of that, of which it takes a lot of figuring out how to do that. So, and I talk about that in the book. Lastly, I think you talked earlier, Carol, about this is all about making eventually transformative change and you got to have courage. That's one thing. You know, I started the broadcast here with this idea that my brother was murdered, and it shaped everything I did. And it, it shaped the idea that, you know what, McDonald's could fire me tomorrow. That's how I, I really thought that way. I go, you know what, I'm just going to keep forging ahead. I'm going to do what I think is the right thing to do. I'm not going to be a jerk. It's not my personality. I'm going to collaborate, have teamwork, and be positive and optimistic and all the things I believe in. But I'm going to fight for what I think is right. And I'm going to have the courage to stand up and be the one to vote against it if I feel it is and, and all that. But anyway, you got to find courage somewhere because uh, you got to do it a lot of times. I mean, I did it a lot of times in my career at McDonald's. All the leaders that are profiled in the book were all very courageous in that they went against the grain because you're creating something new. So that's my last piece of advice as well. Well, th that's wonderful. And um, both Chris and I want to thank you, Bob, for this really insightful and candid conversation. Um, again, we will promote this so that we hope that um, many, many thousands of people can listen to this. And uh, we look forward to seeing your next chapter. Oh, thanks much. And I want to close today and asking our listeners what is your purpose? Thank you.